Yes, uh, Zia, you have a question? Yeah, I had a question. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of based off of the question, the supplementary problem three. I don't think I was, I understood how to take like the sum of work and like to find the efficiency. Mm -hmm. the, I, like, I guess I didn't understand how to do that. I'm not correctly. sure what you're supposed to do there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so for, for finding efficiency, we want to do two things. Um, basically, you know, let's work. Okay, so um, we, you know, we have a process, and the process it, it could look like anything. It doesn't really matter what it looks like, but we have to find the the network, which is just the area enclosed by my process. Um, if this is going from point A to point B to point C, we could also say this would be the work from A to B plus the work from B to C plus the work from C to A. So I'm going to get the same value whichever method. So generally, I like to do the area better um, if, if it's a shape that I can find the area of easily. Um, then we have to find the heat input only um, and so you know just for the sake of argument this one might have heat going in there and heat going in there but heat coming out there so if that's the case we would have a QAB and a QBC and a QCA so just suppose for the sake of argument that on AB and BC the heat's going in so then this input would be um, QAB plus QBC, but it would not include QCA because QCA would be heat going out. If I don't know that for sure, then I just compute numbers, and if the number's positive, then that's heat input, and if the number's negative, then it's heat output. Um, and then to get the efficiency, I just do the network over the uh, heat input. So basically I'm going to have to compute this, I'm going to have to compute this, and then I divide them. And that's going to give me the efficiency as a decimal number, so typically we multiply by 100 percent to, to make it in terms of a percentage. Like if I got, you know, 0.25, then that would be 25 percent efficient. Uh, so does that clarify it for you a little bit? Yeah, it clarifies it, but I think, and I'll probably ask after class then, because I did that, but I still wasn't getting what they got. Okay, so yeah, after class, let's take a look at that. Um, all right, does anyone have any other questions before we begin? <coughs> okay, so we are going to today um, learn about waves. And the, the discussion that we're doing really focuses on waves primarily in strings or in, in you know, instruments. We probably at the end we'll get to talk about waves in a pipe, like an organ pipe or a flute or something like that, but kind of restricted to, um, to waves in musical instruments. But a lot of what we learn will be relevant to waves in general. So that if you take the second semester class, for example, and we talk about light waves, a lot of what we learn will be still relevant to, to that. Um, it's also relevant to water waves and you know, just any, any kind of wave-like motion. So I want to begin by showing you uh, the simulation that is for the lab. And I'm going to use that as kind of a demonstration to, to discuss waves. So let me just share that. OK, so, um, so what we have here is, hopefully you can all see that, <coughs> is a, uh, a beaded, it's kind of like a chain of beads. 
and one end is fixed, and um, the the other end is held by a wrench, which I can move this wrench up if I want to. I can move it down again, and if I move it up and down quickly, we see you know a wave, a wave. We call this maybe a wave pulse. That wasn't a very good one, but there, there's my wave pulse. And uh, so we have some features here that I want to discuss before I really get into um, waves, just about this demo. So I can also change the end to a loose end. So the end of the chain is attached to a ring, which is allowed to slide up and down on a rod. And so in that situation, you know, the, we're going to see the behavior is, is different from when the end is fixed. And we can also put no end so that if I just move this thing up and down, it, you know, it's like an infinitely long chain going. I'm not really going to use that in the lab or today's discussion. So let's talk about the fixed end. Now, on the bottom, we have tension and we have damping. So damping is like friction. I can put a lot of friction on there and then you know, the wave, it dies very quickly. It doesn't really even make it to the end. Or I can put no damping at all. And then even just a little bit of a wave, it's going to keep going forever. Um, and we can change it to slow motion if we want to really watch, like, how does this thing move? How does it happen? Uh, but most of the time, we won't want slow motion. We could occasionally want to pause it and just step it one step at a time to, if we want to look at some intricate detail and, and really see dig, what's, dig into it. Um, but generally, it's just going to look like that. So if I want to stop things, I can just click Restart up here. And that's different from Reset because the Reset button on the bottom right well, if I do that, it puts everything back, like the damping back to a little bit of damping. So if I've been making some adjustments, maybe I, I change the damping to off, and I'm doing something, I want to keep playing with those parameters. I'm just going to hit restart. We also have tension. Okay, so I can change the tension. And this is a very low tension. And we first thing that's obvious we see when there's low tension that the velocity of the wave is much smaller, much lower than when there's high tension. And if I increase the tension, you know, we can increase the speed of the wave. So those are some of the variables that we'll be playing with. Now, in addition to just manually moving this wrench up and down, I can, um, I can set it to a pulse. So the pulse gives me a machine that when I click it, it just, it sends a triangular wave, and if I have some damping on, that thing is going to die pretty quickly. So I can change the width of the pulse, making it very narrow, or making it fat. Oops, I have two waves going at once. Making it a very wide wave. Okay, so those are some parameters. I can play with. And let's go back to a, a narrow pulse. I can change the amplitude. So the amplitude is basically how high up and down this thing goes when I pulse it. So if I have a low amplitude, this is just a quarter of a centimeter, then the amplitude will be low. And on the other hand, if I turn it way up, then my amplitude will be high. If I want to make some measurements, I can put rulers in. And we can measure the height of this wave peak, which looks like it's right about one centimeter. Um, we can measure the width of it, which it looks like, oh, I, yeah, these are centimeters. So it looks like about one centimeter in width as well. Um, and if I have damping on, I can see how the height goes down. Okay. And 
you know, not much is happening to the width, but the height, the height is going down. So, um, so those are things that we'll be using in the, uh, in the lab. We also have a timer. So if I send a pulse and I want to measure the velocity of this pulse, let's turn the damping off. If I want to measure the velocity of this thing, then typically the strategy would be to measure the length of the string and time it to go, you know, maybe there and back. If I want to get better result, then I time it for one, two, three, maybe ten of those, and then I compute the velocity with total distance over total time. Um, now, one thing I want to kind of warn you about, if you are, when you're in the lab and you're making measurements of the time, is if this thing is traveling and I'm going to start my timer right when it, it gets to the left edge. So, you know, normally what happens is I, I, I pause it. Maybe I get it going, I get it moving. And I wait, I'm just going to click this play, this time button right when it hits the left edge. And I had a little bit of a delay on my screen. but And then, you know, I'm going to stop it right when it's on the left edge. It doesn't matter that it's still going. Okay, so you don't want to try to time and then press play. The other thing is, when I'm counting, when I start the timer, do not count in your head one. Because we're counting complete trips, so back and forth. So if I start timing, and in my mind I go one, two, then I'm counting two for the first trip. I really need to start with zero, and then it makes one complete trip, and then I say one. So it's going to be when I'm when I'm timing, it's more like this. I go zero. And now that's one, and now that's two. Okay, so this is just a common mistake we can make in physics lab when we're counting things because when we're counting time intervals, we start at zero, which is different from when you're, you know, working. At, I worked in a movie theater in high school. And we would have to, you know, count cups. So when you're counting cups, you start with one. When you're counting time intervals, you start with zero. Um, okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, then the last but not least, we can. Well, let me show you what happens if I send multiple pulses. So we've got a pulse, and then another pulse, and then another pulse, and another pulse, and another pulse. I can keep sending pulses at regular intervals. And if I do that, we may see, you know, a pattern. And depending on how well I time it, let's try again being very even with my timing. So we start to see something like a wave-like pattern. But it doesn't look super wavy because I'm using triangular pulses. So what we can do instead is we can put on oscillate. So on oscillate, what happens is this, you know, this rod that goes up and down is connected to a circular um, wheel so that it goes up and down in a smooth fashion. And once I do that, I start to see something that looks kind of wave-like. Now, when I'm doing oscillate, I can again adjust the amplitude of the oscillation. I can also change the frequency. So if I have a high frequency, oops, I'm on normal. I want to go on normal. If I have a high frequency, it's pretty fast. Okay, and if I have a low frequency, I can't have a zero frequency, but if I have a very low frequency, we see something, you know, very different. And so we'll be exploring this. Um, in particular, 
what we're going to do is we're going to search for special patterns. Okay, so what do I mean by special pattern? Um, I'm going to make that more precise later, but I want something that looks like it repeats. And right now, I, I, I don't have something that it kind of repeats, but then it, it goes on a cycle. I get kind of a big, you know, a big wave here and nothing on this side. And then later on, I've got kind of one, two, three, four humps. So if, but if I change the frequency around, and this takes a little bit of time uh, to do it, but if I change the frequency around and hone in on certain key magical frequencies, then I can get a pattern that sort of stays put. It just looks like it's repetitive. So a couple of features about these special patterns when I find them. The amplitude is going to get very large when I'm close to a special pattern. So let's get away from a special pattern. Now my amplitude is not very big. Okay, and I could turn the initial amplitude down. So I've got very small oscillations and um, they're getting a little bigger. And if they grow and grow and grow, then I'm close to one of my special patterns. So this looks pretty close to a special pattern where if I pause it so we can see there. What we have, we have a maximum and then a minimum, a maximum and then a minimum. So we would call these two on the top peaks and these two that are kind of like valleys, they're called troughs. I'll write that on the board later. But we have a total of four maxima, four humps. And then we have one, two, three fixed points. So these points stay relatively fixed. If you watch them, just watch this bead right here. It pretty much doesn't go anywhere. And the same goes for this green one and one of these red ones here. They barely move at all. So those are called nodes. And depending on the frequency I choose, I can get more or less of those nodes and peaks. So let me restart this and we'll see what we, uh, what we get. Okay, so in this case, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight maxima and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Maxima means, and that's the plural, plural of maximum, it means, you know, high or low points, extreme points, the tops and bottoms, the peaks and valleys. And if I change the frequency, you know, around, um, you know, low enough, I could get a situation where, um, you know, in this case, it looks like I'm going to have one node or I'm close to having just one node. And then I have two peaks or two maxima. I guess a peak and a valley always at the same time. And if we go even lower in frequency, usually it's good to restart after you change the frequency because <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the oscillations that are already present will take a while to go away. You can also turn on a little damping to help with that. So here I get, you know, maybe no nodes, but I do get one peak or valley depending what time of the cycle it is. And the fact that the amplitude is getting higher and higher without my, my doing anything. Very small amplitude of a driving force, very small thing there, um, but I'm getting a very large amplitude. That means I'm very close, if not on, the special frequency that I'm looking for, okay? So we're, I want you to have all those visuals in mind as I go back to the whiteboard to uh, start kind of making this more explicit. 
So let's get the whiteboard back up. Any questions about the simulation before I put the whiteboard back up? Okay. Okay, so we are talking about waves in strings. And now that we have that picture, I want to start defining a few things. So imagine we have a, um, a, a line as a reference line. And, and by the way, I, I should have shown this to you. There's, there's a box to click for a reference line, and you can, you can put a reference line in to help you measure the height of peaks or um, things like that. So suppose I have a reference line and I have a standing wave that looks something like this. So uh, if I want to make some definitions, the amplitude is defined as the distance from the center line to one of the peaks or one of the valleys. Okay, so it's just from the center line to the extreme edge. And this is called the amplitude. We then have a wavelength. So the wavelength is the, the distance it takes before this pattern repeats itself. So you can look at it from one node, skip a node, and go to the next node. That, that's when leaving this node looks the same as leaving this node. So there's an extra node in between. So wavelength is not from one node to the next node. It's one node to skip a node and, you know, the second node. Or you can look at it as from the peak to the next peak. And we give this the Greek symbol lambda. Now, one thing we could notice um, from that simulation and what you will notice in your lab tonight is that because the, the ends of my string, you know, one end is fixed and the other end is only moving up and down a little bit, so it's almost fixed, that when I go faster and faster, we got more and more of these humps. And, you know, what we kind of see visually, if we don't pause it, Look at once it's moving fast, we just see kind of something that looks along those lines. So you'll see some diagrams like that in the problem books. But that corresponds with, if we would pause it, a single one of these waves. Okay. So, um, what we saw was as we increased the frequency, we got more and more of these humps, and that means that the wavelength was squeezed into a smaller and smaller space. And in general, what we find is that the frequency is proportional to one over the wavelength. So the bigger the frequency, the smaller the wavelength. The smaller the frequency, the bigger the wavelength. And that's a trend you'll see in the lab. Now, if we want to know what kind of controls the frequency and the wavelength, it's really the velocity. So the velocity of the wave, and this is something you're going to measure in the lab, is given by the frequency times the wavelength. So um, what controls the velocity? Well, we saw that the tension, when we increase tension, we get a fast velocity. If we decrease the tension, we get a slower velocity. So velocity depends on the tension. So I'm going to... Um, 
demonstrate a few of these things for you uh, using, I've got a guitar down here. So I'm going to demonstrate them using a guitar so we can connect, you know, these terms with the sounds that we hear from the string uh, as it vibrates. So let me just kind of change my setup a little bit. Um, okay. All right, so uh, this is a guitar, and as you know, um, it's got strings, right? And each string, if I strum the strings, they each give a characteristic pitch. We hear a pitch. So that pitch is a measure, or a, it's our way of proceeding the frequency. So the higher the frequency goes, you know, if I put a high frequency, we hear it as a high pitch. A low frequency, is a low pitch. So what kinds of things on the guitar affect the frequency? Um, so the, the number one thing is the length of the string. And if you, you know, look at the guitar, the, the length of the string goes from the bridge here to the, the nut at the top, and those create fixed points. So when I plug the string, then it's going to oscillate back and forth at what's known as the fundamental frequency. This frequency is the one that has the entire strength. That's just one node to one node, so that's half a wavelength. And I'm going to go back to the, the, um, you know, the whiteboard and, and kind of illustrate this in a few minutes. But that's the, the lowest frequency that this can oscillate at. Now, if I cut the string length in half, and I do that by, by touching it in the middle, and there are little metal frets that are there that basically create subdivisions of string lengths, certain ratios that make, you know, frequencies that to a Western ear sound nice. Okay, so this is not, um, there's not really an exact reason why these are the notes we use. In fact, it, the guitar is tuned not really properly. Um, it's tuned slightly out of tune always so that it's in tune with a piano. And a piano is tuned slightly out of tune so that it can be played with a variety of instruments in different keys and it doesn't sound bad in any of the keys. It doesn't sound really good either. It sounds sort of, it's like they kind of averaged out how the badness so that it's equally bad in every key. And, and guitars have been uh, changed, you know, in the last couple hundred years to, to fit what a piano does. We can talk about that later um, if, if people are interested in that. But right now, if I cut the string length exactly in half, then this is an E. This is also an E, but it's a higher pitch. It's exactly double the frequency. So I'm just what I'm doing is I'm changing the string length. Now the, the node is where my finger is to the bridge. That's half of the string length, and so I have basically cut the wavelength in half. When I do that, I double the frequency. I can even, I don't have to hold it down. I can just touch it in the middle and pluck it. Are you guys able to hear this okay? Does it come through on the audio? So when I pluck it just touching and I take the fingers off, it keeps that high frequency because I force the node to be in the center of the string. And even when I release the string, the node is still there. So there's the E, here is the harmonic, where I just touch the string, and this is if I hold the fret down. We can hear those two notes are the same pitch, but they sound a little bit different in their character, um, what we might call the timbre. So I can also touch the string at the, um, at sort of the three-quarter mark. That's another E. I just forced now a node at the quarter mark, the half mark, and the three quarter marks. So if we could zoom in, if I, if I had uh, on campus, I have a document camera so I can zoom in on this and show it to you. But there's, that's E, E, E. So those are three different octaves of the same note. Now I'm only using the string length to make those different notes. But what else can I do? Well, 
I have a str another string that's the same exact length. All of these strings have the same length, but when I pluck them, they have different notes. Now there's two other variables on the strings. One is the tension. So the tension I So I can loosen it, and as I loosen it, it gets deeper and deeper. So, um, so I can change the tension. That's one variable, but it's not very convenient to play guitar by just changing the tension all the time. So changing the string length by uh, using fingers is, is better. The other variable is the string itself, the material the string is made of. And it's not really so much the material. It doesn't matter if it's silver or brass wound or steel wound. That doesn't matter. It's actually just the density of the string. And in particular, it's called the mass density, the linear mass density, which means how many kilograms per meter of the string. So if you look at my e, my fat E string, you can't see it. It's the fat metal one. It's a low pitch, and then I have another E string that is a uh, actually two octaves higher. Um, that's just a skinnier material. Now the tension on all the strings should be roughly the same because when you construct the guitar, you do it in such a way that you know. You put strings on it to try to keep equal tension or else the neck will start to bend one way or the other over time. So generally the tension should be in the same ballpark. Um, and it's really the string material or string density that makes a difference. Um, if you go for, away from a guitar to another instrument, if you go to a violin, it is a shorter instrument because it's shorter, the wavelengths are shorter, and smaller wavelength means higher frequency. So the pitch of a violin is higher than the pitch of a guitar, typically. And if you go in the other direction, a cello or a concert bass, those have longer and longer strings, and so the, the pitch, the frequency gets lower and lower. Um, all right, any questions so far? All right, so then there, there are other characteristics of the sound. So for instance, And I don't know how well this will come through the, the microphone. So where I play the guitar changes the sound. So just listen for a minute to this. That should sound kind of tinny. I can play a different spot. It's a little bit more full. And if I play it up here, I don't know, can you tell the difference between this and that and these? So those are the same notes. So what's the variable there? It's the same guitar, the same strings, the same string length, the same tension. Everything that I've talked about so far is the same, and yet somehow the sound is different. That's very tinny. If I want it to sound like a banjo, it's hard to play it holding the guitar up like this, but you know, it sounds like a banjo or something. Up here, that's very sweet sounding, at least to, to my ear. It's a very sweet sound. So the difference is that when I play just the E string, it's got a frequency that is the frequency of the E. And I don't know offhand uh, the, the number of hertz that is. I know an A uh, is 440 hertz, which means 440 oscillations every second. So this is definitely somewhat lower frequency than that. But when I pluck it here or here or here or any of these places, I'm still getting an overall oscillation at that rate. But there are secondary oscillations and tertiary and, you know, all the other areas, second, third, fourth, fifth. There are other vibrations going on in the strings, which are known as other harmonics. And they're the, 
the notes that you get when you, you know, that and that one, all of those tones are, are in the sound that we're hearing. And they mix in different ways. And they mix in different ways depending on where I play the string, but they also mix in different ways if someone else plays a different guitar. Maybe the same manufacturer. This manufacturer is called, it's Garage Sale Guitar. Or maybe it's, basement, it's my basement guitar. Um, if I got a guitar from the same manufacturer with the same wood and put the same strings on and everything and I play it exactly the same way, it will still sound different. Um, so that, there's a, almost a fingerprint for each instrument that has to do with how those different frequencies are combined to give an overall sense of the, the main fundamental frequency, but all of the higher harmonics are present. That's also what makes a difference between, you know, humans' voices, why my voice sounds different from one of your voices. Um, so, you know, computers are getting really good at analyzing the, the sort of wave pattern of voices and then mimicking them. So this is actually fairly new technology within the last few years. It was not possible, say, you know, 10 years ago. Um, but now we can analyze the, the waveforms well enough to get the characteristic frequencies that go to build up someone's voice and then create new sounds using that voice. So be wary because that's <laughs> someone's going to use that improperly uh, in the near future, most likely. Um, all right. So any questions uh, so far? Okay, one other thing that I can do to affect the sound is I have here what's called a capo, and it's just basically a clamp that I can put over the strings, and it, you know, it just changes the pitch. It, it makes all of the strings shorter, so, you know. If I play the same thing, so it's it's basically I can change keys by just changing where I place this. So that makes it so I don't have to learn how to play lots of stuff in different keys. Um, certain uh, other instruments don't really have that ability. So um, you may have a, an instrument that only plays in B flat or in this key or that key. And that's really why the piano was designed the way it was. So that um, instead of the notes being certain harmonic ratios of string lengths, they take uh, an A, a 440A, and an 880A, an octave higher, and then they split that difference, which is 440 hertz, into 12 bits. And those 12 bits are, are increases of the 12th root of 440 hertz. And so there's a sort of equal spacing between the notes, which basically makes it sound a little bit out of tune compared to... Um, you know, the, the other concert instruments. But it's not very out of tune no matter what key you're playing in. So to most ears, including my ear, it sounds pretty good. Um, okay, so let me put the, the whiteboard back up and I'm gonna illustrate some of the things that I showed you there. Okay, so um, just to, to fill in a, a couple more uh, terminology here, pieces of terminology. This is these are called nodes. Yeah, 
not notes. So I guess they're each each one is a node. And these guys, the peaks or valleys, when we see this whole pattern, we don't really differentiate if it's a peak or, or valley. It's just called an anti-node. So when I'm playing uh, the guitar, we have the ends of the guitar, and we have a pattern that just looks like this. When I pluck the guitar, this is known as the fundamental frequency. Um, it's also known as the first harmonic. So what harmonic means is if, um, if I would drive the string at that frequency, so going back to the simulation, if I found just the right frequency that was that lowest frequency I found, my pattern just goes up and down like this. Even though the end is moving only a tiny bit, I get, if I drive it at this frequency, this harmonic, then I get a large amplitude. Because basically what's happening is the string has a natural frequency it wants to vibrate at if I pluck it. And if I drive it at that frequency, the, the oscillation gets bigger and bigger. This is basically exactly like what happens when you're a little kid and you go on the swing set. And, you know, the swing, if someone pulls you back and pushes you, it has a certain frequency. It goes back and forth in a certain, you know, it takes a certain number of oscillations per second. That's its frequency. And if you pump your legs at that frequency, you can get the oscillation to be very, very big. Because what you're doing is you're kind of giving yourself a little push every time you're at the back. And as long as the push is always timed in such a way that it, corresponds with the natural frequency of the, of the swing, then the amplitude's gonna get bigger and bigger. And that's what's happening here when I, um, if I would drive the string. Now, playing a violin is more like driving the string. You're dragging a bow across it and the friction is making it vibrate and it makes it vibrate at its fundamental frequency. So the wavelength, remember, is from one node, not to the next node, but to another one that doesn't even exist. I'm just making lines to kind of show that the stream feels like there's another section, sort of a ghost section. So that the length of the string for the fundamental frequency is actually just the wavelength over two. So we could call that, um, you know, lambda one, and we would say it's equal to two times the length. Then, as I demonstrated with the guitar, if I hold it in the middle and just pluck it, but keeping the, my finger touching the middle, I create a node in the middle. And then the pattern that we see, if you watch the string vibrate, it looks kind of like this. It looks kind of fuzzy in the first section, fuzzy in the second section, but there it's not moving in the middle. So in this case, the length is just equal to lambda. And we could call this lambda, lambda 2, which is just equal to the length. And this would be called the second harmonic. But it's also sometimes called, this is more by music people, the first overtone. OK, so fundamental frequency and first overtone, or we could call it the first harmonic and the second harmonic. If we subdivide the string into three 
equal sections. Is that equal? We get something that looks like this. So in this case, the wavelength, we call that lambda 3, is actually just 2 thirds of L. And so maybe we'll do one more and see if we can see what the pattern looks like. So in this case, the next one has four antinodes. And I mean, it's not necessary to fill in all these little squiggles. But we would call this lambda four. So the number here, you can see it's, it's correlating with the number of antinodes we have. And this would just be, we get a complete wavelength, one, one node, skip a node, next node. So that's half of the strength. Half of the string length. That's the strength. Uh, the string length. Okay. So lambda 1 is 2L. Lambda 2 is L. Lambda 3 is 2 thirds L. Um, did I, am we getting that right? Yes. Um, and lambda 4 is 1 half L. So it's, it's a little hard to see the pattern unless we think as always relating to 2L. So this is 2L times 1. This is 2L times 1 half. This is 2L times 1 third. And this is 2L times 1 fourth. And I'll give you one guess what the wavelength of lambda 5 is. Go ahead and see if you can figure that out. I'm sorry, I, I wrote lambdas here. I, I meant to write L's. So it should be 2 bits L. So basically, we can say lambda N is equal to 2L over N. That gives you the wavelength for a certain harmonic. If I want the first harmonic, also known as the fundamental frequency, I would put in just n equals 1. If I want to know the fifth harmonic, I put in n equals 5, and I find the wavelength of the fifth harmonic. All right, any questions about that? Okay. Now, when we, um, when I play an E on the guitar, I get not only the first harmonic, but I also get the second harmonic, the third harmonic, the 157th harmonic, the 7 millionth harmonic. Okay, all of those harmonics are represented. And the various, like, weights, they're, they're kind of weighted. I get mostly the fundamental frequency, but I get some of the first harmonic some of the second harmonic, but in different ratios for different guitars, even though it's the same strings, the same woods, everything, but there are just slight changes. That's why our voices, even though our vocal cords may, you know, be the same length, um, they're going to have very different characteristics. Um, and that comes about by the mixture of, of all the harmonics, how the harmonics are mixing up to create the sound that we hear. Now, we only perceive 
on the surface, the fundamental frequency of, of the sound. But then the character of the sound is how we perceive the mixture of all of the other higher harmonics. When I was plucking my guitar near the bridge that sounded tinny versus in the center that sounded kind of sweet, at the center, I am exciting the fundamental frequency, this one, the most, because I'm plucking it at the center. And so I'm, I'm driving it to sound very much like the fundamental frequency, and the amount of these guys is reduced. As I move more and more toward the bridge, I get more and more higher fractions of these higher harmonics. And that's what leads to the, the change in the sound. All right, any questions so far? All right, a few more uh, bits of terminology and then we'll take a break. So we know that the speed of the sound wave is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. And so for a given lambda n, there must be a frequency fn, the frequency of that harmonic. Keep in mind the velocity of the, the wave in the string has to do with the material the string is made of, out of and how much tension is on the string. So that typically is not going to change uh, while I'm playing the guitar. But as I change the wavelength, the frequency then changes. If I double the wavelength, the frequency is cut in half. If I cut the wavelength in half, the frequency doubles, and so forth. Now, the velocity is equal to the square root of the tension over mu, where mu is called the linear <coughs> mass <coughs> density. Mu is defined as just the mass of the string over the length of the string. So those are the two features that determine the velocity. <coughs> Putting that all together, then the frequency n times lambda n being equal to v, we could say frequency n is v over lambda n. And that's the square root of T over linear mass density over my formula for lambda n, which was 2L over n. And this gives me n over 2L times the square root of the tension over the mass density. So that's a formula that allows us, if we know that the tension of the string and the type of string, the mass density of the string, and the length of the string, then we can find the frequency of all the harmonics, whatever we want to know, without really doing any extra work. All right, so um, any questions about those uh, formulas? Okay, uh, Ziad. Um, I missed something that you had at the very end in the last frame set. That makes sense. You missed what? Like there was something on the last frame that I didn't quite get at the very end. Oh, you want to see that one? Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? Haley? Um, when you have the N on the bottom of the equation, is that like number of moles or is that something no. else? No. So the N is the number of antinodes. Okay. Or we could also say it's the number of the harmonic. So that is if it's the first harmonic n is one, if it's the third harmonic n is three. Okay, thank you. Sure. Other questions? All right, let's take a short break. <laughs> 